Becky. Thanks everyone for your patience this morning. Um, I'm Stella Wisdom and I'm going to talk about the digital storytelling exhibition which is currently on at the British Library. And um, Before that I'm just going to give a quick overview about the British Library for anyone who, who's not visited the library. Um, so we are the National Library of the United Kingdom. Um, we're one of six legal deposit libraries. Um, there are two other national libraries. Um, we've got National Library of Scotland and National Library of Wales and we will collaborate closely with them um, through the work we do with the other legal deposit libraries. Um, but talking about the British Library, we've got vast collections. Um, you can see in the photo here um, the King's Tower. So this is a real kind of iconic feature in the British Library's building in London. It's a, it's a glass tower of books and they're all from King George III's collection. Um, um, it really is a kind of stunning feature. Um, and George III, I think he was worried that his sons were going to sell off his books, so he left his book collection to the nation. And that's why we've got them in the British Library and, and they're on display. Sometimes if you're in the building you can see the shelves move and a, a book retrieval assistant going to fetch a book on a trolley so that's always quite magical when that happens if you're in the building but we're not just about books we've got vast um, manuscripts and archive collections we've got we've got all sorts of manuscripts from Jane Austen to James Joyce from Handel to the Beatles including some really wonderful Beatles um, handwritten lyrics on the back of Christmas cards um, so 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 they really um really are kind of precious um i i could i yeah i could talk a lot about this but we include include the sound archive um, and we've got um, all sorts of sound recordings inclu including including uh, very kind of fragile sound recordings on on wax cylinders but but up to the present day where we're recording TV news stations um, 24 seven for our for our TV, TV um, archive. So vast, vast collections, increasingly digital, um, definitely not wanted to forget the UK web archive. And I'll mention them again in this talk. So this is one of the largest collections in, in, in the library. Um, yeah. Again, so so I've gone from the iconic um, King's Tower to showing you a photo of inside of one of our storage buildings at Boston Spa in Yorkshire. Um, so I mentioned the scale of the collections. We estimate that there's 170 million items in the library's collections, but but honestly, um, we don't know the true scale of them. They really are vast um, and they're growing fast. So eight kilometres of shelving each year and we're, we can't dig our basements in London any deeper than they go. They already go four basements deep underneath the library. Um, they're deeper than the, the London Underground and you can hear the tube trains sometimes if you're in the basements. So we're increasingly building Amazon style warehouses in Yorkshire um, to accommodate the collections. What I should also mention is if you tried to see all of our collections, um, if, if you looked at five items a day, it would take you 80,000 years. Um, so no one person is going to be able to see the whole collection. And on the next slide, I'm going to show you um, a, a video. So that's that's. Um... Oh, sorry. Hopefully this will play. The British Library has a copy of every book ever published in the UK, or at least it should have. If you're in the UK and you publish a book, magazine or newspaper, then by law you have to send a copy here. A lot of countries around the world have similar laws and similar libraries. The rules for what must be sent here were pretty simple to understand until the end of the 20th century when the web came along and suddenly books and publishing weren't quite as easy to define. In the print world we collect everything so anything you can imagine whether that is uh, an nhs information leaflet local magazine or the most expensive journal that you can imagine all those beautiful art books that cost thousands of pounds those kids magazines that you see on the shelves in tesco's with the plastic toys on we collect all of those it's everything down in the basement here there's obviously a huge amount of storage but it's not enough and here in London, land is expensive and construction is difficult. So while there are millions of books stored here, they're only the ones that are the most requested. The rest of them are with the robots up north. The library collection in total is around 170 million items. The vast majority of that is, is legal deposit. Often publishers know legal deposit and will send them in. Um, more of a challenge can be very small publishers or people who don't necessarily think of themselves as publishers. So we put a lot of effort into reaching out to authors, creators who self-publish, all those kinds of organisations to say that the work is really important to be saved and preserved. 
In total, there are more than 700 kilometers of shelves, and most of them are stacked up here in one of the colossal low oxygen storage buildings in Boston Spa in Yorkshire. I was not allowed to attach a camera to one of these robots. They are far too important. The library's using up those shelves at about eight kilometers per year, so they've just started construction on their next storage building, which should be good for a few decades. Lots of the stuff that gets sent out free tends to be ephemera and it will be lost over time. A great example is a recent exhibition up in the National Library of Scotland all about the information that was provided at the very beginning of the AIDS epidemic. That material, if you go out to somebody on the street and you ask them, should we be collecting this? No, of course we shouldn't. But we're able to learn so much from that. We wouldn't have that exhibition if we hadn't collected that free material that came through people's letterboxes. If someone in London wants a lesser used book from these stacks, they need to give 48 hours notice. It'll get picked out by these robots. They go up to 50 kilometers an hour. If you can hear wind rustling on my mic, it's because they shove air out the way as they travel through the stacks, and they automatically store items that are used more often close to the front. The books are then put in a truck south to arrive in the reading rooms a couple of working days later. More than a thousand items go back and forth each day. But publication means something different now. Not only are there books that are only being published as digital files, but there's the web. Legal Deposit has expanded to include publishing on the web as long as we can identify that as being within the UK. So if someone's creating a blog or creating their own website, we will try to collect that. The UK Web Archive has actually become one of the largest parts of the collection. Billions of files, about one and a half petabytes of data. A digital newspaper, for example, is very different from a print newspaper. So we have to make sure we collect both because the editorial intent of both is very different. And in addition to that, there are emerging formats. You can read books which change as you move the iPad around. You can read books that change depending on your location. How do we capture that today to make it available for researchers in 10 years, 50 years time? You know how often you have to change the operating system on your phone. So it's quite difficult to keep up with those changes. I've used the British Library for research a lot of times. The books you request can't be borrowed and taken away. They have to stay with the researcher at a desk inside one of the reading rooms, returned after they're done. This is a library of last resort. If you want to get a library card here, there will be a short interview about your research and why you can't just pull the books or material you want from your local or university library. The importance of legal deposit not being selective and being everything is we can't decide today what's going to be important in 50 years time. We want everything because we don't know what will be important. I cannot overstate just how useful it is to be able to track down things that never made it online or to research out of print forgotten books where there are no other copies available or to scan through every issue of an obscure local newspaper to track down one reference. This is the raw text of history as it happened and someone has to keep it preserved for the future. <laughs>So, um, thanks for bearing with me while I played that video, but I just wanted to show you that because it shows some interesting footage of inside our new storage buildings, but also um, the basements and, and the reading rooms and kind of stresses stresses our collections. Um, that video was made by Tom Scott because um, in 2023 this year, we are not only celebrating 50 years of the British Library existing as an institution, but 10 years of electronic legal deposit where we've been had a, a legislative mandate to collect digital, including the UK web archive. So, so that's why we, we're kind of celebrating this. Um, what um, my colleague Linda in the video that you've just watched um, mentioned when she was talking about how we're collecting new types of publications, that's what I'm going to really focus on in my presentation now and the exhibition that we've got on. So sometimes we call these collections emerging formats or sometimes we call them complex digital objects. But what I'm really referring to are publications that are born digital um, with no I no kind of identical print counterpart equivalent. Um, often they consist of more than one media type. Um, often they're non-standard formats and non-standard media types. They sometimes divide dependent, so there can be hardware dependencies. They're not typically part of um, our existing collections and they are really vulnerable and at risk of rapid obsolescence. So there, there's a real kind of digital preservation um, kind of challenge for these types of materials. Um, 
With um, the interactive narratives that I'm going to discuss in the exhibition, many of these um, are interactive websites, so browser-based works. Often they look like apps, um, but they're actually, like I say, they're actually designed to be read on on a mobile phone and, and tablet browsers. So we were able to collect many of these works in the UK web archive. Um, and we've built three collections, especially for these works. Um, we've got an e-publishing trends emerging formats collection. We've got a collection that we've built with the New Media Writing Prize, which is, is run by Bournemouth University. And I'll talk more about um, some of of these works but we we archive their shortlisted and winning entries and increasingly we're interested also in digital comics and web comics and we've been collecting these in their own collections um, and and we've been experimenting with different types of web crawler so so we use heretrix um, for our main um, annual crawl but for some of the these kind of thematic collections where we're trying to do um capture capture interactive sessions of some of these types of publications we're experimenting with different types of web crawler um so so conifer and web web recorder um and and this these are kind of interesting because then we're trying to work out what makes a good capture so um yeah, I've just mentioned collaboration with the New Media Writing Prize, um, but collaboration with with writers and researchers who are working in the field of experimental digital literature is really, really important to the work that we do at the library. Um, and I just wanted to flag up the Ambient Literature Project, um, which took place a couple of years ago, which was looking at play place and storytelling and technology that there's a book I've just put um, an image of of the book that was published at the end end of that project um, and I've also collaborated with with Adventure of X which is a narrative games writers convention um, I've held Adventure of X twice at the British Library um, sadly it's moved and it's now being hosted at Greenwich University um, there was sadly a fire at the British Library in our in our conference center so we couldn't host the event last year and they've moved to Greenwich but it, it's it's meant that they could expand the event and, and increase um, capacity. So, so very happy that they've got a new home. So on to the exhibition. So, so, so um, digital storytelling is an exhibition that, that features these complex digital and emerging formats works um, that I've just mentioned. It's been, it's opened in June and it really is going into its final week. So if you find yourself in London um, until the 15th of October, then I urge you, please do visit the British Library to see this exhibition. Um, what we've tried to do, so the concept of the exhibition is looking at the impact of new technology on both both writing and reading. And we're looking at how, um, how it's influenced the way writers write and also it's changed the reading experience for readers. We've focused on 11 different stories um, and, 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 and some, I'm not using the word fiction because some of them are not, are not works of fiction, um, but these are all 11 different stories that use technology in different ways to respond to the presence of the reader within within the story. Um, there are themes, many of the works are interactive narratives, but some of them are, are kind of location based works. That's very, very challenging if you're putting works that are meant to be read um, it, outside in the environment and you're putting them in a fixed in a fixed gallery but I can talk about that when I go through through the works um, and we've also looked at story worlds uh, as well and and I'll talk a bit about a bit about that um, but we've not put the works into different sections um, in in the gallery space um, visitors can explore any of these 11 works in any order that they want um, but what what I'm going to try and do for the purpose of this talk is is to kind of just walk you virtually walk you around the gallery um, in 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 the kind of order that that if you, if you did like a linear walk through and the first work that you you see when you go in is 80 days by Inkle Studios um, this is a literary adaptation of of, of Jules Verne's novel um, Around the world in eighty days, um, but Megna Jayanth, who's who's completely rewritten this story, um, has really kind of turned it on its head and written in lots of new routes and locations that you could do. So inside the exhibition, we have got a map on the wall, and it and on the map 
map, it shows the route of the novel, but it also maps out all of the possible routes that you can do in this game. So 80 Days is available on Nintendo Switch, but also on Steam Store, so you can play it on a laptop um, or PC. Um, it's also available on Android and Apple, so you can play this on your tablet or on your phone. You play as, as Passport 2 accompanying Fog um, on the wager to try to travel around the world in 80 days. And it's an interactive adventure. Um, the, the game mechanism is... Oh gosh, there's so many things hap happening in this work. You you can you can um, go to market and trade items, so you can sell items that you've packed, or you can buy new items. You can you meet people through your adventures, and you can have conversations with them. Um, you you can take different modes of transport um, around the world, um, but but you also there, there, there's lots of kind of subtle game mechanics. You there's 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 a heart at the side of the game which measures the relationship you you have as passport two with fog so sometimes throughout the game you have options where you can read read a newspaper to him or maybe give him a shame shave or comb his hair and so and so the photograph on the side shows some of the ephemera which um, accompanies the Nintendo Switch edition so you can see a shipping timetable and a, a comb and we've got these on display in the gallery next to a playable a playable copy of 80 days um, so really interesting interesting work. What I should also mention, um, Meghna Janth has, has kind of looked at issues of, of kind of colonialism. Obviously, the original novel is a product of its time, but in, in kind of this kind of reinterpreted, um, rewritten work, some of the aspects of the, of the initial story. So, so in the initial, um, in the, in the first novel, um, Jules Verne um, writes it so that Fogg rescues an Indian princess. But in in this kind of um, reworked version of Eighty Days, the reversal of that happens, and, and the Indian princess helps Fogg out. So so it really is quite a delightful work, and and. And a very wordy work. So Magna has written more more words than are in Lord of the Rings. Um, so so for 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 um, Inkle's eighty days. So it really is a kind of very very um, text driven work. I'm probably taking too long, so this is going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour of the works that we've included in the exhibition. Um, Opposite 80 Days in the Gallery, we have Breathe by Kate Pullinger. Um, this is a ghost story that Kate has written to be read on a mobile phone. Um, this was commissioned by the Ambient Literature Project, which, which I've already mentioned. It uses data feeds to personalise the narrative. So, so when you're talking to the ghosts in the story, um, they, they know where you are. So you can see in this middle image where there's a screen grab of this work and it says where where I am here in London, West London, Shepherd's Bush in my room. So if you're reading this in a different location, this personalises it to wherever you are. Um, and, and it kind of really creates a kind of uncanny, Kate is using kind of data feeds to personalise the novel. And because this is a ghost story, it's trying to make the reader feel uncomfortable that the kind of characters in the story, they know where you are. They know whether you're warm or whether you're cold. Um, it, it, it's kind of creating this 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 kind of claustrophobic is probably the wrong kind of word, but it, but but it's kind of trying to give this kind of eerie effect. The challenge for putting a work like this in a gallery in the British Library is obviously it's a fixed location. So so this is a work that's meant to be read where you are at where you are wherever you are whether you're reading this at home or whether you're reading this in a park or somewhere else and the challenge like I say is putting this in a gallery it's always going to say so um you're in the you, 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 I'm here with you on Euston Road which is the location of where the British Library is but I've put the URL so this works um it's not an app it works in in a in a web browser on a mobile device so you can read this wherever you are it also, you're invited to take um, a photo. So it uses the camera of your device to take a photo of your location. We've had to switch that off in the gallery because we couldn't have visitors taking photos of other members of the public in the gallery space. But when you read this at home, you, you take a photo of your location. And again, that comes up in, in some of the screens as you're reading the work. And again, it's trying to make, make, you, make you feel that the characters in the story, they know where you are, they're with you in your room. Um, and it also uses the giant so that's when you kind of tilt and tip and shake 
the device. We have got that working in the gallery, but we've had to fix the tablet to a bendable stalk. So it's a little bit more clunky than, than obviously if, if you're just kind of holding your phone or tablet at home. On to the next story that we've included in the exhibition it is a demo of Windrush Tales. Um, this has got some really wonderful um, hand watercoloured and hand inked artwork. The full this is a publication that's not actually been published yet, um, but I met the um, narrative designer and the kind of the lead of Windrush Tales. So that's Shella um, Ramanan at Adventure X. Um, so Shella was presenting at a previous Adventure X. I knew she was, her and her team were working on Windrush Tales. And because 2023 is the 75th anniversary of the Empire Windrush docking in Tilbury Docks, um, we thought it would be very timely to include a demo with Windrush Tales in the exhibition. It tells the story of, of two siblings, um, Vernon and Rose, who you can see in in this illustration of a of that's of a photograph um, and Vernon has moved to the UK and he invites his sister Rose to join him and the narrative is about their experiences of, of migrating to England um, so this is what the front screen of the work looks like and this is what the work looks like in the gallery space so we've got an exclusive and um, playable demo of this work we've also exhibited it alongside a mood board and um, which you can see in the middle of of of, of this photograph um so so and there's family photographs of of Corey and, and Shella who were the writers of this work because they've been speaking to um family members about about their experiences of moving to the UK um but they've also had workshops with elders from the Caribbean community talking about these issues and they've been writing this into the story in the glass box you can see that there's a book in a case so we've displayed um the lonely londoners next to this work so the lonely Lond Londoners is 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 widely perceived as the kind of definitive novel um, telling the story of, of kind of Windrush migration. So we, we thought it would be really nice to display that alongside Windrush Tales. On to a very different work um, is Dictionary of the Revolution by Amira Hanafi. Um, and this this is more kind of interactive documentary or data journalism. Amira went out onto the streets of Cairo in 2011 um, to talk to people on the streets about the Arab Spring uprisings. And the circular diagram that you can see on the right, um, she, she, she's pulled out all of the kind of the key words from these interviews. She originally started making this work um, making a deck of cards with the vocabulary from these interviews, but that she then turned it into um, a, a, like a, a visualization. Um, the thickness of the blue lines that connects these words shows the strength of the connection. So how, how frequently the words kind of um, occur with each other. And you can click on any of the words in the circles and it, and it opens up new data visualizations. Um, and on the left is transcripts of, of, of the conversations that she had with with people. Again, this is a browser based work and I've put um, put the the kind of the URL to this work. Um, she originally created it in Arabic and in the exhibition um, it starts up in Arabic, but the, there's a button to then read it in English. But in the gallery, you can read this work in, in both Arabic and English um, and it won the New Media Writing Prize. So, so, so this is why we've collected it in the UK Web Archive. It's a really powerful work and it's very unlike anything else in the exhibition. And we were really keen to include it because we wanted to show that writers who were kind of creating documentary works and kind of um, doing kind of news reporting and talking about real kind of political and social issues that they are also using technology in in interactive ways to tell their stories and it really is not just um, writers writing kind of um, fictional works so, so really really kind of profound work in a similar vein is See You Later by, by Dan Het. Um, so this is a twine work. Um, some of you here may, may know about twine. So twine is is a free open source tool um, it, that you can use. You can use it either in a web browser or you can download an executable to create hypertext works. Um, See you later. It seems the title seems quite flippant, but it becomes really um, quite heart touching when you realise that see you later is actually the last message that Dan Het received from his brother Martin um, 
before he learned that Martin had died in the Manchester um, bombing in 2017. Um, and See You Later is, is actually an account of Dan's experiences of the night of the attack when he does, when he, he's learning what's happened at the arena. He doesn't know whether his brother is dead or alive. Um, he, he has lots of missed phone calls from his parents and his family. Um, and the work goes through all of his emotions, all of his experiences, um, everything from kind of interacting with people on social media and trying to work out what's going on to journalists contacting him, the police contacting him and, and just kind of all, all of the drama from that evening. It's a very personal or autobiographical work. And what's interesting is normally with twine narratives, you could go backwards and there's options to go backwards. But but Dan has deliberately written this work in a way that you can only go forwards because, because obviously on the night he couldn't turn back the clock, he couldn't stop the attack, he couldn't rewind time. So in this twine narrative, it's interesting from the point of view that when you make decisions, you have to stick to them and you can only move forwards. Um, it really is a moving work. And when we've taken school groups and groups of young people into the gallery, this is the one that, that we've had the most feedback about it really even though it's quite from a technological point of view it's quite simple it's it's all in text there's no images there's no video um it, it is like i say a high hypertext branching narrative it, it really is very moving and you really do feel that you're kind of stepping into dan's shoes in this really difficult moment that he faced so so i really do urge you to to kind of have have a read of of this work um Onto something completely different is Zombies Run by Six to Start and Naomi Alderman. Um, if any of you are kind of runners, you you may have listened to this work. It's an audio drama fitness running app. It started off as a Kickstarter campaign in 2011, 2012. It, it's been very, very successful. And um, they actually, so Naomi and um, Adrian and Six to Start sold the company for 9.5 million um, a couple of years ago. So, so it has gone from a kind of small Kickstarter to being a very successful, um, popular work. Um, in in recent times, they've they've been working with Marvel, and their new work is Marvel Move. Um, in the gallery, um, I kept joking. I wanted a treadmill in the gallery. So, so you're meant to listen to this, listen to Zombies Run while you're out for a run um, you can you can use it with location while you're running outside or you can use it with step count so you, so you could use it on a treadmill but you can also kind of have it they don't call it armchair mode but but with these kinds of work I call it armchair mode so that you can listen to this if you're on an exercise bike or um, a rowing machine or, or something like like that um, we've got video footage so at the end of this photo you can see um you can see a projected screen. What we've got is is a video of people running in different environments because sadly for health and safety, I was not allowed a treadmill in case anyone fell off the treadmill and sued the British Library. That was not allowed. But you can listen. There's headphones. You can um, put the headphones on and watch the video footage of people running and listen to a Zombies Run mission. Um, um, the photo you can see, so so some of the Zombies Run team, including Adrian Na and Naomi, came to the opening of the exhibition, and I was really pleased about that. And Naomi Alderman lent us um, a digital script, and and this might seem a small thing, for, but for me, this was kind of... Um, Cutting new ground for the library because we borrowed a digital script from a writer and we exhibited it in digital form. It's shown on a tablet and you can kind of read through the PDF script. This was important to me because um, some of my colleagues wanted to print the script out and put the paper in a glass case. And I was very keen that we didn't know, didn't do this because this was a digital loan and in a digital storytelling exhibition. And I was keen that we showed this as, as a kind of digital script on, on a kind of device. Um, but there is a glass case and you can see a book in a glass case there um, there is a book about zombies run and there's a fold out map um what's quite nice on the map is it's of london and you can see where the british library is and in the map um, the british library is, is in a safe area not in a zombie infested area so we thought it was quite nice to put the book in the exhibition as well to show that the british library is is safe from the zombie zombie hordes um I mentioned, sorry, I, I'm, let me just have a uh, mouthful of drink. I'm losing my voice. I mentioned um, story worlds um, and, and the 
story worlds um I, I suppose the kind of more academic term is is transmedia but because this exhibition has been curated for the public um we've we've opted not to have too much jargon in the interpretation so we've called them story worlds obviously there's big kind of commercial examples of of of, of kind of transmedia story worlds like like star wars and doctor who and, and lots of kind of superhero and, and kind of disney story worlds but what we've the example that we've selected for our display is Clockwork Watch um, by Yomi Aini. Um, and Clockwork Watch is told through one-off immersive theatrical events um, that we, which which tell the story. And these are then documented into graphic novels. So you can see a photo, photos on the on the side of my screen. You can see a top hat. So so Yomi encourages um, attendees to dress up and participate in his events and you can see um, a scene from from Kendall where um, one of the clockwork work events is 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 taking place and, and at this particular event um, um, it was focused on the angel corpse so this is an all-female ki kind of um, military military band um, um, in their uniforms but but then what happens at these events is documented into graphic novels there, there's now a whole series of these graphic novels um, and we're having the next um, the next theatrical event at the British Library on Friday the 13th of October in the evening where we are turning the library into the world of Clockwork Watch for one evening only um, and what's going to happen at our event is so in the story London has become quite dystopian there's lots of crime on the streets it's quite a dangerous place so the rich are moving to properties on floating islands above London um, and we're going to have a fictional property auction um, where 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 you can buy uh, buy buy your place of safety on an island in the sky but we've also got um, wet plate Victorian photography we've got a steampunk market it. We've got chap hop music with Professor Elemental, and we've also got that you can explore 19th century London in Minecraft with with the people I've worked with at Lancaster University who do Litcraft. So, all sorts of things happening. The digital aspect of this is actually the Clockwork Watch website, which looks like a Victorian newspaper. It's it's called the London Gazette, um, and in between the theatrical um, LARP style events and the graphic novels is this is kind of like a conduit between those and it, it's it's it, it kind of tells the story between the events and, and, and the comics um members of the public again can write for the london gazette and, and it's really quite interesting that they've got this online website but but it's made to look like it's a victorian newspaper um, and before i forget as well is they they also sometimes sell pin badges and 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 um and and a woven patches that you can kind of decorate your outfits with um Often, often they do this to raise money for deserving um, charities in in Africa, and and Yomi is really interested in his in his steampunk narrative. It really is addressing issues of race and empire in this work, and the and the story focuses on um, a family who've moved over from India. They're scientists and inventors, and they've invented clockwork automatons. Um, and and Yomi has really tried to create a story world that invites um, everyone. To participate he really wants um um all people to feel welcome and and then the badges we've not included the rude one there's one that say, says um fuck colonialism um love steampunk we've not put that in the exhibition but we have put the one that, that's got the kind of um the, the fist of black lives matter in the cog and so and so like i say clockwork watch sell these pins um to kind of um not 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 just to promote their story but to raise money for for and act as a kind of social good I'll try not to run out of time. Um, I've got a few more works that I would like to describe um, to you. Um, one of these is Astrologasta by Niam Niam, and I'm actually going to try and play you the trailer of this work. So this is an Elizabethan medical history comedy, and it's told through a digital pop-up book. And it's kind of hard to describe this without kind of showing you um, what it looks like. So I'm going to hopefully this video will play. Mr. Foreman, you have been called before this assembly of the College of Physicians to answer the charge of practicing medicine without a medical license. What have you to say in your defense? Uh, well, in 1592, I saved the lives of countless Londoners 
curing them of the plague using the very latest innovations in medical astrology. Since then, patients have come to me seeking treatment for their medical problems. To advise them, I find answers in the stars. I have many patients from all walks of life. And I think you will find, sir, that they are most satisfied with the quality of medical care I provide. It is only a matter of time before I gain my medical license. For I am not a quack, sir. I am a true doctor. <laughs> Silence. Constable, shackle this man and take him from hence to jail. Uh, but, sir, uh, pray afford me the chance to... Uh, unhand me, you rogue. So, I was, I, was, I was just quite keen to show you the trailer for that because it kind of conveys just how kind of del delightful this kind of interactive work is. What I found very interesting is this has been a collaboration with historians at Cambridge University uh, who are experts in the history of, of Simon Foreman. He was a real quack doctor for many years. He wasn't wasn't licensed, but he did become licensed towards the end of his career. But um there's a large collection of his manuscripts in the Bodleian Library in the University of Oxford, um, and they contain many of these star charts. So you can see um, the photograph show on the right shows um, an example of, of a manuscript page from this collection. They're very difficult to understand. They're very kind of scrawly, but... Um, but Lauren Castle, who Professor Lauren Castle, he really is the expert in the kind of these casebook um, manuscripts, and she worked very, very closely with um, Jennifer Schneiderite of, of Niam Niam Games, and they've created this game which uses the 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 astrology and the star charts as as the game mechanic and it's very amusing the other thing that I really like about about this work is each patient has their own um theme song which is which is a, a madrigal style song and it's the only work in the gallery where you don't listen to it in headphones because I insisted that we have speakers in the gallery so you can hear the soundtrack because it's so hilarious and so beautiful um, and what I was really pleased is we had um, live singers in singing the soundtrack um, as one of our events to accompany the exhibition it was the first live performance of the soundtrack and it really was um, kind of ma magical they never thought that it would ever be performed live and I'm just so glad that we could make that happen in the in the library oh sorry I've gone too fast um going from that um it is we've got an example of of digital poetry um this is a picture of wind by J.R. Carpenter um is a weather poem for phones that's a bit of a tongue twister um and um, Joe Carpenter created this work as a response to the storms in the southwest of England in 2014. Um, it's got um, a sideward scroll as well as um, so as well as scrolling downwards. The the picture here is that you can see on my screen is not really how you're meant to read read the work. You're meant to kind of see one of these columns at a time and scroll up and scroll down to to read new um, poetry for each month of of the year. Um, the text in blue is dynamic and changes, and it changes based on on um, on on a data feed of, of of wind speed. So you can just see and under where the text says rough blustering days, and um, you can see the wind speed. Um, so originally this pulled data from the Dark Sky API, um, but Apple bought Dark Sky and shut down that API. So this this work actually broke before we were about to install it in the gallery um, but we we rescued it and, and the library we we paid for J.R. Carpenter's developer to um, modify the work so that it it used the Met Office in the UK's um, weather data and used their API but what was quite interesting is the two APIs were not identical so one of them used actual wind speed and the other used projected wind speed so we got the work working again but it wasn't quite identical to how it originally was um so 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 that's kind of quite an interesting reflection and shows the kind of vulnerability of these works i'm pretty sure no one at dark sky and no one at apple were aware that this kind of acquisition and turn off of, of a data feed was was affecting an experimental poet's work um but but that in obviously in this kind of in this kind of digital world where people have got lots of dependencies this this kind of thing can happen and again i've 
this is available online and I've I've put a link so you can kind of read this is a picture of wind at home on your phone another another work that's meant to be read on phones um, and again is available online is seed by joanna walsh um this is also an autobiographical work but it, it's kind of very literary it, it's um joanna has, has focused on memories of, of growing up um in in a rural part of the uk in in the 1980s and it's all kind of like personal memoirs what you do is you click on one of the botanical illustrations and you follow a vine and each each colored vine um goes through a, a kind of sequence of, of memories um it, it's you, you you can you can switch on so that you can view all of the vines or you can you can just explore one vine at a time um and she's also published this as a slip, as pamphlets in a slipcase edition what i found quite interesting is the artwork for both is very different it's very abstract art for the um physical um physical hard copy slipcase edition and it, it's this kind of very detailed botanical illustration for the digital the digital existed first um and it was actually the focus of of joanna's um phd um I, I did kind of make a bit of an argument of could we include the phd thesis in the exhibition but sadly my my colleagues in exhibitions were like, no one wants to see a PhD thesis in an exhibition. The public won't be interested in that. But I was a bit sad because um, we do have a large repository of, of PhD theses, ethos. And I did kind of think that if we could have included um, included the thesis, we could have uh, could have kind of um, advertised and promoted our ethos service. But it was a pleasure to include this work in the gallery. And again, there is a vulnerability with this work because sorry. Joanna developed this work with um, Editions at Play and with Google um, Cultural Lab, but, but Google um, have, have been doing some restructuring and have closed the lab in Sydney that created this work and also breathe with Kate Pullinger down. So these works are still available to read online, but because, because like I say, Google have restructured and closed the creative lab down that kind of collaborated to make these works, there's a little part of me that wondering how long they will be available on the live web. So therefore our archived captures in the UK web archive become increasingly important if, if, if like I say, these might not be online for in the, in the future. I, I am getting towards the end, so so sorry if this has been a bit of a romp, a romp through the works. Um, the, fi the final work in the exhibition is Wolves in the Walls, um, and this is by Fable, um, a studio based in San Francisco, and it's a literary adaptation of the children's book by Neil Gaiman and Dave McKean. So you can see the photo at the bottom is is a page pages of the book, um, and the photograph on the top shows an image from the VR work. So in, in the VR work, Lucy, the character, draws around your hands in chalk, and then you enter the work. Um, and then once you're in, in this game world, you can do all sorts of activities with Lucy. She gives you a Polaroid camera for you to take photos. She can hand you a game controller and you can play a game in the game. Um, you, you can pick up crayons and you could do some colouring in and you can also do things like make jam. It really is absolutely delightful. Um, a bit like my sadness of not having a treadmill for Zombies Run, we've sadly not got the VR in the gallery and the reason for this is is you use the hand controllers to do all of the, these activities and there was not um, space to make a safe area and also we would have had to have had a member of staff just sitting next to this one work all of the time for health and safety reasons um, to avoid someone either injuring themselves or another visitor in the gallery so so we we thought we we wanted to include um, VR to kind of show how writers and and um, creatives are, are telling stories in VR, but because of kind of health and safety limitations, it, it's it's we were not able to in include that ourselves. But what I wanted to mention next is for many of these works that I've described, we've been looking at what can we collect in the library in addition to the interactive digital work that also kind of describes a publication, how it's used and the context it was published. Um, so, so we've been collecting interviews, playthroughs, reviews, blog posts, etc. And we're increasingly looking at this as a method uh, of kind of collecting um, to, to kind of record these types of publications. So I've already spoken about the ephemera um, that, that came with the Nintendo Switch release of 80 days. Um, so this is kind of part of our contextual collecting. But 
but also recorded interviews and in the gallery. So if you've visited the exhibition, um, you'll see that there are interviews with with five of the creatives. Um, and so Adrian and Kate and Megna and Yomi and Dan have all spoken about their work. So we've used clips from these videos in the exhibition, but we're also adding adding these recorded interviews into the library's collection so that researchers um, can use them in, in the future if they're interested in these types of, of stories and publications. We've also made three playthrough videos. So there's lots and lots of, of game playthroughs on YouTube. We can't collect those in the UK web archive because we don't, we don't, um, we don't collect YouTube um, kind of video content is mostly out of scope and also there'd be rights issues with playthrough videos made by other people so we have worked with um, Florence Smith Nicol um, a PhD placement student at the British Library and Florence made us three great playthroughs um, playthroughs of Wolves of the Walls 80 Days and Astrologaster and we've got these playthrough videos on display in the exhibition and again like the interviews with the writers and creatives we're adding the playthrough videos to the library collections and you can see Florence there with the hand, hand controllers and the VR headset making um, the playthrough for Wolves in the Walls. So so I'm wrap it, wrapping up now, but we've had an active event season accompanying the exhibition. Um, we had a conference on the 7th of July, Mix. Um, normally Mix is at Bath Spa University, but for one year only, we had Mix at the British Library um, and I worked with Kate Pullinger um, whose work Breathe is in the exhibition. So Kate, Kate Pullinger is a professor at Bath Spa and I, I work with her and her colleagues to bring Mix to the library. We had an evening event after the conference with J.R. Carpenter, whose work This is a Picture of Wind is in the gallery, but J.R. Carpenter brought um, a new performance piece, An Island of Sound, which um, used digitised British Library book illustrations um, in, 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 the, in the visuals, but she also worked with a sound artist, Jules Rawlinson from Edinburgh University, and Jules used some of our um, wildlife recordings in, in his kind of live ambient soundtrack. So we managed to use some of the whale songs, which funnily enough were, were on display in our other exhibition, our exhibition, our animals exhibition that was running over summer. So, so we had a nice kind of mashup between the animals exhibition and digital storytelling for an island of sound. And we, we, we creatively reused some of the wildlife sound recordings in the soundtrack. Um, we've had... A writing school, um, Fiction as Di Dialogue, um, was our writing school at the end of August. And we had several of the writers whose works were featured in the exhibition guest teaching on the writing school. So that was a pleasure to hold. Um, on the 15th of September, we had the historian Lauren Castle in conversation with Jennifer Schneiderwright, the game designer, um, talking about making Astrologaster. And we had um, a live performance of, of the singers singing the major goals from the soundtrack. Um, and coming up so if you can get to London for the 13th of October um, then I really kind of urge you to come and, uh, and I'm just going to give a, a plug for this we're, we're working with Clockwork Watch and we're having a digital steampunk event we're bringing the world of Clockwork Watch to the library next week on Friday the 13th to turn the library into a kind of immersive theatre party at the library so if, 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 if it's easy for you to come to London next week and I appreciate this is an online talk so you may be in many parts of the world but if you if if you can come to the library then please do so um because it it's it's going to be we're going to go send the exhibition off with a bang so the exhibition is closing on the 15th but the friday before the exhibition closes we're having this epic party and that is me so i'm stella wisdom um i've just put a link to my department's blog so i'm from the digital scholarship team in, at the british library um and yes thank you very much Thank you.